gonna be taking you through my, I guess, run and gun filmmaking setup. So that's gonna include my video rig, and I'm gonna go through my lens kit and the filters that I use. Firstly, let's get into the main component of the rig, which is the Fujifilm X-H2S. I found this camera to be a nice middle ground between an actual cinema camera and a hybrid camera setup, but I'm just really loving the look that is coming out of this camera. I've read that a lot of people find the image to be too sharp, and it's really easy to soften images up. In my last video, the using the Fujifilm as a cinema camera, I pretty much didn't touch the softness or sharpness. I left it straight out of camera, just so you can get an idea of what the footage looks like. Now getting into the actual rig build, I think I should say this. I have the Fujifilm X-H2S, but you don't need to use this camera with this rig build. You can just replace it with whatever camera you have. As long as you use a camera cage with your camera, you'll be able to pretty much copy this exact same build. But yeah, it's a small rig cage, and it does add a good amount of weight to help stabilize the footage. And on top of the cage, I have a NATO rail so that I can mount my top handle. This is the same top handle that I pretty much use across all of my camera bodies. I wouldn't say it's the most ergonomic, but it definitely gets the job done. Then attached to the handle, I have a small rig monitor mount so I can attach my monitor cleanly without it being too tall. As for my monitor, this has definitely been one of the best investments that I've made. It's the Blackmagic 5 inch view assist. And not only is it a monitor, it's also an external recorder. And you can actually record B-RAW externally on the Fujifilm X-H2S with this view assist. However, I haven't had good results doing so. I tried it when the camera first came out and they released the firmware update for the Fujifilm camera and the view assist. But for some reason, the footage just doesn't look as good as it does at a recording internally. I'm pretty sure I'm doing something wrong or I need to download another update. But so far, I'm happy with just recording internally. But back to the actual monitor, it does SDI in and out and HDMI in and out, which is good. Um, when you're working with mirrorless cameras like this, you're probably going to be using HDMI, but with cinema cameras, you're going to probably be using SDI. So this monitor has been covered throughout pretty much every range of cameras that I'm most likely going to be using. Now moving on to the bottom of the rig, I do have a small rig base plate and uh, 15 millimeter rods. And these are the rods that have the ability to uh, screw into, which I'll get to in a second but I believe these are the four inch, but I also have eight inch and 12 inch. It just depends on the lens that I'm using. And attached to the rod, I have a small rig follow focus to help me pull focus when I'm solo shooting. Getting on to optics, I'll go through the lenses later, but I do uh, use pretty much all the time with this camera, a Metabone speed booster. This is not an absolute necessity when it comes to this camera. I do it because I find the type of shooting that I like is shooting wide. So to take full advantage of my lenses, I use a speed booster. It is pretty pricey, but there is a Viltrox version, which is way cheaper. I haven't used it, but I'm assuming you get pretty close to the same image quality. Now getting onto how I power everything, the monitor, the camera, and potentially any other accessories that I have. I use a micro V-mount battery, but what I wanna get into is these two accessories that allow me to pretty much freely move this battery without having to disassemble the whole rig. So the first one is this 15 millimeter rod battery hinge. And this is why you gotta make sure that you choose the 15 millimeter rods with the screw on because you basically screw on this battery hinge into those rods. And then after that, all you need to do is get yourself a mini V-mount plate to attach to the battery hinge. Then you can attach your V-mount and then freely move the V-mount. And this is useful for those situations where you need to have access to your monitor. And normally when I'm shooting, I have this closed because everything I need when I'm shooting is on my monitor and also on this uh, X-H2S little display at the top that pretty much lists your settings for you. Another thing about the X-H2S is you can buy an additional cooling fan, which I do have. I luckily haven't found myself in a situation where I need it but I do take it with me on every shoot, just for reassurance. Okay, I think the last thing I need to touch on is cables. So I power the actual camera through USB out of the V-mount into USB-C on the camera. Then I power the monitor through DTAP, and then lastly, just the HDMI to the camera. But this is pretty much my run and gun setup that I'm pretty happy with. 
I also do want to mention that I released some F-Log2 conversion LUTs for the X-H2S and any new camera that uses F-Log2. And I basically just went through and corrected some of the issues that I found when using Fujifilm's F-Log2 conversion, such as this weird magenta shift, and also smoothened out the highlight roll-off and skin tones, and also included a tiny bit of a film matrix look, enough to make the footage pop ever so slightly, but not enough to actually be a full-on film emulation. So you can use it either as your base of a grade on top of another film emulation, or just use it as a Rec.79 conversion when you're going for a clean look. Now I've included two LUTs, an actual just straight Rec.79 conversion and another Aerial Log C conversion. And the Aerial Log C conversion LUT is useful if you're using other programs or other uh, power grades that use Aerial Log C as an input. And this is especially useful right now because there isn't a color space transform in DaVinci Resolve for F-Log2. That's up in my store if you're struggling with using F-Log2. Now let's get into the lenses that I use, and I do actually have two different sets of lenses. I don't plan on having both of them for long though, I'm gonna be just keeping one set. So let's first get into the first set that I build, which are uh, these Carl Zeiss Jena or Jena lenses. So my set includes uh, 20 2.8, uh, 35 2.4, 51.4, 81.8, and 135 f3.5. Now, if you're interested in building a similar set, it can get a little bit confusing because these were made in two different mounts. They were made in PB mount and M42 mount. I do have the PB, which might be newer versions compared to the M42, if I recall correctly. It does get really confusing, especially since they have Zeiss in the name, but I don't think they're technically Zeiss. But one thing that I do know a lot about is just the characteristics of these lenses. These are all sharp lenses. They're not clinically sharp like my other lenses that I'll get into. They are still somewhat soft, but you know, you still will resolve the full detail that you need. But what I think makes these sets of lenses really special is their 3D pop. And for me, it just comes down to the way they render space. So just the way that they separate your subject from the background is unlike other lenses that I've used or unlike, you know, modern lenses that you're using. And the bokeh is also pretty unique, especially with this 35, you get this really nice swirl on your corners. But yeah, just the background separation is pretty crazy. Even if you're at a 5.6, you get so much separation with these lenses. My favorite of the set is definitely the 35, which is also I think the cheapest out of all of these and the easiest to find. I'd say the weak link of the set is definitely the 20 mil. And I think, you know, it comes down to just it being a wide angle vintage lens. It's just really soft, wide open, but I have seen other people have really solid copies of this lens. So I also think there might be an issue with it or there might be some fungus. So I'm gonna get it cleaned and hopefully that'll solve the issue but I think you do have to be really lucky to get an amazing copy of this lens. Now, as you can tell, these aren't just straight vintage lenses. They have been modded, so they have been one EF converted. The aperture has been declicked. I've added a focus gear, and I've also added a front ring and front cap. I got the focus gear, the front ring, and the front cap from Simod, which offer really great products when it comes to modding still lenses. I do have the PB mount version of these lenses and for some reason I haven't been able to find a great EF conversion so I do have them all converted but the the mount is just very flimsy and when it's mounted onto the camera it kind of leans over a bit not enough to actually I think make a difference in the actual footage but it's just a weak point in this cinematic conversion so hopefully um, someone will make a better PB to EF mount that I can replace these with. I'm going to touch on these lenses a little bit more, but first let me actually introduce you to the other set that I have and then I'll compare them with each other. Now these sets of lenses are referred to as the Zeiss Classics. I believe they were released in the early 2000s, so they're a lot more, I guess, modern compared to the Jenna's that I'd say were produced in maybe the 80s or 70s. 
These are also the ZF2 versions, which basically means they have the aperture ring and were originally Nikon F mount. Now, why do I have this set when I have these? And the first reason was because I was looking for more wide angle options. So the first lens that I picked up, which was actual, actually from the same person, was this 15mm 2.8. And my plan was just to pick this one up and just try and match it as best as I could with this older set. But the person that I was buying this lens from was selling the rest of these lenses with four of them being all cinematted by two closed lenses. And the person was selling these for a ridiculous price. I still can't believe I got these lenses for that price. It was pretty much a steal, so I decided to pick them up. If I like them, I keep them and sell these or vice versa. And if I were to characterize these lenses, one, they're sharp, they're clinically sharp, which can be a good thing in some situations. I mean, I honestly think it all just comes down to preference. Another thing that these lenses have a lot of is chromatic aberration, which some people don't like very much, but when it comes to, I mean, I think just chromatic aberration in general, it helps with the 3D rendering of the image when there's that slight chromatic aberration on your subject. I think it just helps uh, separate it, but in some really, really high contrast situations, especially this 35 f2, the chromatic aberration can be a lot, and I wouldn't say it ruins your image, but if you don't like chromatic aberration, I wouldn't look at these sets of lenses. The bokeh is also closer to that of a vintage lens compared to a modern lens. I'd say in terms of bokeh, both of these sets have a lot to offer in terms of that but I do enjoy those of the Jennas uh, a little bit more. But long term, I see myself taking on more narrative projects. I'm lucky enough to be in a situation where I can kind of just pick and choose the types of projects that I want to be a part of. And for narrative, I don't think these Ice Classics are necessarily the best or the most ideal. So I'm gonna be getting rid of these pretty soon. If any of you all are interested in um, the set, uh, hit me up. They have all been EF converted, two of these have been done so by myself, and then the rest were done by Duclos. And I've also added these front rings and cine caps. So yeah, feel free to let me know if you're interested. Last thing we're going to cover are the ND filters that I use. And for the longest time, I used these Nisi hard stop ND filters. The only time I didn't use these were when I owned the Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro and had internal NDs. And after selling that camera and moving on to all the other cameras that I experimented with, it was really hard not having internal ND filters. But that was until I picked up the Nisi Variable True Color VND. This is basically a variable ND that has little to no color shift and little to no cross X pattern that normally you get when shooting on wide angle lenses. And after owning this, I really haven't missed using internal NDs all that much. It's still not as convenient, but it basically allows me the flexibility of variable ND on any camera that I own. But now Nisi actually sells what's called the Swift system. So that includes this variable ND, which is one to five stops, then includes a five stop ND filter, then also a one fourth black mist filter. But now what makes these filters unique is that you can actually just stack them together. Once you screw on the VND, it's easy to just stack each filter on top of one another. And it seriously just saves so much time if you need either diffusion or to cut down on some more light with the five stop ND filter. So essentially your one to five stop turns into a five to nine stop. And you really won't need any more ND than that. Now I've personally gotten used to adding diffusion in post in DaVinci Resolve, but for those that don't have time for that or don't want to do the post processing, you have a filter that will bloom the highlights and soften up skin tones and will work easily with the rest of the VND system. Nisi did send this system over to me, but even if they didn't, I'd still be using this ND system. It's just the most convenient and it just makes sense when you don't have internal NDs. You can also use these filters independently with an included adapter ring in case you end up not needing the ND filters but want to use your black mist. 
Well, that's my filmmaking setup. I'm sure it's gonna change in the coming months, but uh, for now, this is basically the setup that is uh, keeping me inspired. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you in my next videos, which I'm really excited for y'all to see what I've been working on. So I'll see you then. Thank you.